Hello and good afternoon to Physiomics webinar uh, today on cardiac toxicity. We will we will go through uh, basically um, our overview of the modeling philosophy at Physiomics and also predictions regarding and models regarding cardiac toxicity. Throughout the talk, please feel free to ask questions whenever you're ready or whenever you feel like. Um, I'll try to answer them um, either online, right now or live. Um, if, if, if there are too many questions, I'll try to answer them at the end of the presentation. Thank you. So the webinar program today, so I'll give you an introduction to the company, Physiomics. I'll give you an overview of our modeling philosophy. And then we'll move on to the main aspect of this talk, which is around about predicting cardiac toxicity using high throughput screening data. And we'll give an overview of some of the literature models that have been used. These will be four in particular that are focused on a mixture of mechanistic models, which involve large ODE models, um, and also a recent sort of very simple uh, empirical statistical model. Then I'll also then go through the physiomics approach um, briefly, and then show our results and how we compare to the existing models that exist in literature. And finally, I will give a brief overview of our plans for the future and how these models will be, become available. So an introduction to physiomics. So physiomics was founded in 2001 in Oxford. So it's UK based. It was listed on the stock market AIM in 2004. We are based at the Magdalen Centre, Oxford Science Park, UK. Our primary focus originally has been on, in oncology and we've developed many uh, sort of different types of models in oncology with our flagship product being the virtual tumor. Um, in addition to this, we've, we've also used a lot of systems biology methods to help with target validation and so forth. We have recently also moved on to some other disease areas, including for the, uh, the part of this talk is on cardiac toxicity. More classical preclinical and clinical PKPD. So this gives you a brief overview of our products and where they sit within the uh, drug development pipeline. So we talked about systems biology models, um, and they are primarily based, are used in sort of target validation and mechanism of action studies, and they've also been involved in, in lead selection. I talked before about our flagship product, which is the virtual tumor, which is basically an in silico model of a growing tumor, which is primarily used in both preclinical and clinical uh, to optimize combinations and schedules of different drugs. More recently, we've started to develop another product, which is basically Drug Card, which is a combinations and regimens database, which is primarily developed for useful for oncology compounds. And today's talk is more about the cardiac toxicity prediction service. And finally, we've also been recently also started to um, provide preclinical and clinical PKPD. So a brief overview of our customers. So we have worked with large pharma, Eli Lilly, as being our, we've been supporting continuously in the oncology program since 2007. Um, we've also recently been working with them, some other large pharma companies. Um, and we also have a, a series of biotech companies that we also work with. So a brief overview of our modeling philosophy. So for us, modeling and prediction are not the same things. So modeling is, is made primarily a tool for inference. And as, as we all know, inference and prediction are two very different things. But somehow we can use models to make predictions. So the models can be predictive. But how complex and detailed should a model be in order to be predictive? Today, we'll talk about two types of two sets of models. Some are extremely large and complex. Um, and some of these mechanistic models of action potentials and these full sort of full scale models of, that mimic the entire heart physiology. When these models become too big and too complicated, however, it becomes too hard to use and too, and too difficult to parameterize. When I say too hard to use, these systems become extremely difficult to, to compute numerically. Complex models cannot be fully parameterized and are extremely unstable. And so therefore, simple models are often better for predictions. An example of this is also seen in this article um, highlighted here, where they basically look at different 
or new forecasting methods. And what they found is that simple methods tend to outperform the more complicated ones. So now we'll get on to the main part of this talk, which is around cardiotoxicity. So here's a slide that was published um, in 2010 by Will Redfern. And this article basically highlighted the reasons for compound attrition throughout the pipeline. And as you can see at the top is cardiovascular. Uh, a large number of compounds were, are withdrawn from, the, from well, failed preclinical studies. And also you can see that there's a large number of compounds that failed um, during the marketing stage and, and wants post-approval, as well as the preclinical compounds here. Now, of the cardiac toxicities, the one that we're interested in today is basically torsade de poids and also QT interval prolongation. As many of you are probably aware, a wide number of drugs were withdrawn from the market uh, for a period of time in the 90s and early to mid-2000, um, mainly due for torsade de poids or QT interval pro prolongation. Now, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship. QT prolongation does not necessarily mean you will um, gain you, you, will, you, you will, will lead to a fatal arrhythmia such as torsade de poids. However, most instances of torsade de poids have been priorly, previously followed up by a prolongation of the QT interval. So what the industry has been doing is they've tried to look for correlations between what was causing torsade de poids and they found that QT prolongation was quite an important factor. So this association then left, led to, so what was causing prolongation of the QT, and this led to prolongation of the action potential. Prolongation of the action potential has been associated with the inhibition of activity through uh, the IKR potassium channel known as HERG. So we screen everything for HERG. But all these associations and correlations are quite complex, and, then so, is, and so is predictivity. But clearly there is a big advantage of having a molecular screen that is high throughput. And this is what has driven the high throughput ion channel assay technology that is routinely used today throughout the drug development process. And it has now been generalized to more than just HERG to other ion channels as well, as we shall discuss soon. So safety screen in the pipeline. So this brief slide basically shows the sort of number of compounds that go through different stages of the pipeline. Um, as you can see, there's always a, a huge number of compounds early on in the pipeline and less compounds as we move through the pipeline. Now, this is quite a linear process. And basically, whenever we, whenever we develop a new assay, a new technology, the idea is to use it to help us to understand, well, how, what are the effects likely to be in the next stage of the pipeline, the next stage of the development? This slide also demonstrates currently where we are in terms of our cardiac prediction technology. So we are currently using ion channel IC50 values sort of provided by those high throughput screening devices to make predictions um, on the action potential duration, um, effects in ex vivo screens, um, including rabbit QT interval, and um, monophasic action, action potential changes in guinea pig. But there's also this question of, can you go straight from the ion channel IC50s to predictions in the clinic? So now we'll go for a brief overview of the cardiotoxicity models that are currently existing in the literature. So earlier on, I, I mentioned there are two sorts of types of models that, that, that seem to be appearing within the literature. The first are what we call mechanistic models. And these are first, the first sort of action potential model was developed by Hodgkin Huxley for the squid giant axon in 1952. And then this led on to a huge burst of activity in the field. And, and the first sort of cardiac model was developed um, by Dennis Noble in 1962. And since then, if you were to go into Scolopedia, for example, you could find uh, models for all sorts of different types of species and for the different cell types that exist within the heart. Furthermore, other than just modeling sort of single action potentials, single cell action potentials, people have started to couple these sort of single cell models together to start replicating certain parts of the heart, such as the ventricular wall, and also moved on to the complete whole heart. Also, even moving on from that, they've started to couple mechanical feedback into these sorts of models, and including blood flow. So these models have become more and more and more realistic in terms of the biological content as, as, as the years have gone by. 
But as we said before, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be predictive. And what we'll also talk about here is a simple logistic regression model that has been published by Chan Test as well, which also seems to perform quite well. So like I said before, for the literature review, we're going to look at four models, and these have come from four articles. Now, I must admit there are, there are more articles coming out every day, so please excuse the fact that we're only going to co cover a certain number of these articles uh, today. So the four models we're going to be looking at is a model that was described uh, to be able to predict the sort of effects in a dog action potential assay. We'll look at a model that's been developed to look at the predicting the effects in a rabbit QT uh, assay. We'll also look at a model that's been developed to look at categorizing Tossard de Poix with two different categorical systems. So the first model we'll talk about is the dog model that was developed by Davis et al. And this was a collaboration uh, with um, AstraZeneca. So this model made predictions around the activity in a canine action potential assay using data from five of those high throughput screening ion channels. The five channels that they used were basically NAV 1.5, which is responsible for the upstroke of the action potential. We have KV 4.3, which is responsible for this notch phase. We have the L-type calcium for the dome, and we have both the um, slow potassium current and HERG as well for the repolarization phase. So this was an ODE model that was originally developed by Hund and Rudy, and then it was further modified by Benson in 2008 to reflect the different ventricular cell types, the epicardial, mid-myocardial, and endocardial. This final Benson model was further re refined by Davis et al. Um, by sort of trying to create an ensemble of dogs by varying certain parameters. Um, two compounds were used to train the model, and 51 were used to test it. Um, the amount of pharmacology that was explored with, with, with these sort of compound sets was extremely variable. And we'll look later on in, in, towards the end of the presentation about the amount, the degree of pharmacology that's been explored uh, by these models. So like I said before, the Davis model was designed to sort of create an ensemble of virtual dogs. And they, in fact, they created 19 virtual dogs in total. And then a cutoff was used to provide adequate sensitivity, specificity, and predictivity. And this cutoff was then, was then used to sort of say, well, this model is then ready to be used as possibly uh, an in silico screening tool um, within, with, within a pharmaceutical company. One thing that was interesting was that the model was more suitable for, for declaring a compound to be active or inactive rather than predicting the actual direction. And that's what this graph, graphs at the bottom are trying to describe. So if the model was asked to sort of make a statement, well, would this compound be active or inactive in the assay? By active or inactive, what I mean is, would you see either a greater than 10% prolongation or 10% shortening uh, without regardless of direction? Now, what you're seeing here is a percentage score on the y-axis and the cutoff variance on, on the x-axis. By cutoff variance, these are how many dogs do we need to, to say a decision before we make a decision about whether that compound was active or inactive? And as you can see, there was for a low number of models, up to about eight or nine, we seem to get good sensitivity, specificity, and predictivity. However, when you ask the model to sort of dictate, well, what direction does that, what, what direction are you seeing in the action potential assay? The model does not perform that well. As you can see, the sensitivity was reasonably good at 80%. Uh, the predictivity was okay, just borderline um, around what 70%. However, the specificity was quite poor. So in the end, the article stresses that basically this model is more suitable for, for making predictions around about whether or not a compound will be active or inactive in an assay rather than declaring whether or not the, what direction the changes at the action potential are going in. So that was a quick overview of the dog model. Now there's a recent model um, describing rabbit QT predictions by BT et al. And they made predictions of the of QT prolongation, short prolongation or shortening in the rabbit wedge assay. In addition to testing a single cell model, um, they tried to replicate a, a little bit of the of the physiology that exists within a wedge assay by creating a cable equation, a cable model. This involves stringing together a bunch of single cells to try and look at the propagation of excitation along a cable. This was done to, to better represent the wedge assay. 
Um, they use a number of different inputs, and by inputs I mean different sort of screening uh, methodology, uh, screening equipment. So they used Patch Express for, nine, for about 77 compounds. Um, they have an Ironworks data uh, for 121 compounds. And they also use the predictions that you get from QSAR around the ion channel potency for 372 compounds. So this is a quite an interesting paper in, in the sense that they're at least trying to test out, well, how are the different methods that you can use to generate IC50s, how do they affect the, your ability to make predictions about prolongation and shortening? And also they compared whether or not you, need to, you, you would need a, a cable model, uh, i.e. a model that represents more the, bio, the physiology and the biology versus something that's a bit more abstract. So what were the major results um, from the paper? Well, the increase in the complexity did not necessarily increase the predictivity. I mean, moving from a single cell model to a cable model um, did not necessarily mean they got an increased predictivity or sensitivity or specificity. There were similar levels of predictivity we're seeing with either using the Patch Express or Ironworks uh, data when you're trying to make a prediction around QT prolongation. And that's what this table in the, in the bottom basically summarizes those results in terms of how good the, how good the model was at sort of detecting prolongation or shortening. And as you can see for prolongation, it, was, it, was a, it seems very, very good. Sensitivity is around about 72%, specificity 81%, and predictivity 78%. However, for shortening, the sensitivity was, was quite low. Also on this slide, we can see an example of the, of the model that was used. The model was developed by Shannon et al. And it's a brief sort of cartoon that describes the ion channels and transporters that were involved in the model. So after talking about the two animal models, we'll now talk about briefly about the Tossade de Poire model developed by Miriam Zetel. And this was made, this model was designed to make prediction of the red fern categories uh, for Tossade de Poire. So a brief overview of Will Redfern. So he's a, basically one of the leading safety pharmacologists in the inter industry. He wrote a very interesting paper in 2003 on the relationship between the ratio of the HERG IC50 and the therapeutic drug concentration and how that related to the reported number of Tossade de Poix instances for over 100 compounds. And in that paper, he came up with some sort of categorical system. And those categories basically describe the extents of the reported instances of Tossade de Poix. So classes one and two, you could more or less combine together in the sense that they both sort of talk about a high degree of reported instances of Tossade de Poix. Category three is slightly less incidence of Tossade de Poix, but in which are numerous case reports. Um, class number, category number four is basically uh, where there have been isolated report, reported incidences, and category number five is where there have been no reported instances. So we'll refer to this sort of red fern category system again later on. So what they did in the paper is they basically took data for 31 compounds, which you can hopefully see a bit of here in this slide. And these were IC50 values from a high throughput screening or what they got from literature. And the, the data that they were using, again, were for three ion channels. This is for NAV 1.5, uh, the calcium channel, and the HERG channel. And they also had data on clinical exposure for these 31 compounds. They combined red fern categories one and two together because they were interested in reported instances rather than the therapeutic area. So basically they're asking the question, can we predict what category a compound belongs to using this high throughput screening data? And the way they did this is by sort of saying, well, I'll use this high throughput screening data that I get these IC50 values, plug them into an action potential model. Um, what out, depending on the output of the action potential model, can I use that to make a prediction about what category uh, these compounds belong in. So these are kind of the overall results. So they looked at basically what um, uh, the ratio of HERG IC50 of a drug concentration. So the, the marker that was identified by, by Will Redfern all those years ago. And you can see how effective that was in the panel here highlighted in C. So basically what you're seeing here is the error in categorization. So did we get the did we get the prediction completely right? Were we one category away in terms of our prediction? Were we two categories away? Or were we three categories away? And as you can see, the, the ratio of HERG IC50 over the effective therapeutic concentration is, is not such a great predictor of what category you belong in according to the, according to the system here. 
Well, however, what was quite predictive was actually taking the APD90 value from an in silico action potential model. So like I said before, what they did was they took these IC50 values, placed them within the model, ran the simulation, and said, well, what was the APD90 value? And that APD90 value appears to be quite predictive of whether, in terms of what category you should belong in for, that, for a given compound. On the right-hand side here is basically uh, the, the reference and a picture of the model um, that was used to, to make these predictions, and it was developed by Grandy. So here's another alternative um, to Tossard de Poix uh, predictions. Now, in this situation, what, what, the, what the authors did, Kramer et al., and these are the folks at Chantes, is they decided to say, well, instead of having the four or five category system that Redfern and the people uh, by Miriam Zetel had developed, what happens if we just have two categories, yes or no? Um, is a compound likely to be tosadogenic or not? And what they found, which I thought was quite interesting, is that you could produce quite a predictive model by just using a standard sort of statistical technique known as a logistic regression model. Now, what they had was data on 55 compounds, um, and they generated the IC50 values in-house, and they also had the clinical, clinical exposure for these 55 compounds. And what they also did was measure the affinity of these compounds for three different ion channels, being the sodium channel, the calcium channel, and the Herg channel. Highlighted here, here, and here. And what they did is apply a very, very simple model, and what they found, actually, it was is that basically the sodium channel and the Herg channel were sufficient to get quite accurate sort of predictions through a leave one out cross-validation analysis, which is what you're seeing here at the bottom. Now, model one described here, which, which is, is reasonably, reasonably predictive, is just Herg alone. And the model here described on the right-hand side um, basically involves using the equation at the top, which basically involves including both the Herg IC50 and the IC50 against the sodium channel. Now, this model was actually quite predictive when they used just those two ion channel data bits of information. So they correctly classified 31 compounds um, in terms of whether or not they were tosadogenic or not, and they correctly classified 19 compounds on whether or not they were on the fact that they weren't tosadogenic. So overall, they only had four out of 55 compounds in terms of false positives, and only one out of 55 as false negatives. So that's pretty impressive from a logistic regression model. And this kind of highlights the differences, as you might have seen. So from the previous paper, where they suggested you need a really large and complex model to make predictions. And here the people are saying, well, actually, you know what? You can get away with something really simple, and it works just as well, if not better, than the more complex model. So questions we should be asking ourselves right now is, why does this simple approach work so well? And what happens if you do apply this approach to all those other data sets? So we talked before, but the other three models before this one involved large sort of ODE mechanistic models. So what would happen if I was to take this simple logistic regression approach and apply it to those data sets? Would it work just as well? So early on, I mentioned that the, the degree of pharmacology that explored by these models is, is, is quite varied. And, and I think this plot describes it quite well. So this plot basically is a, is a box plot of the degree of antagonism and agonism for each compound, as each compound within each, each paper that, that, that I've mentioned so far. So on the x-axis, we have the details of each channel. So it's Herg, sodium, and calcium. And on the y-axis, we have response. So one basically means there's, there's no effect on the, on the ion channel. A value of zero would mean, indicate 100% block. And a value greater than one would indicate agonism of that channel. Now, as you can see, in the Davis et al. Set, data set, the set that was used for, for building the dog model, we do have compounds that cause agonism of the Herg channel. We also have compounds that agonize the calcium channel. Now, in the rabbit model that we discussed after the dog model, we can see that there is a, re a reasonable amount of activity against the Herg, sodium, and calcium channel. However, there were no agonists in that data set. And similarly, as you move from preclinical to clinical, the amount of ac ac pharmacological activity you're exploring seems to decrease. And this is what we'd expect, as we're quite a risk-adverse people. We, in preclinical assays, we tend to test drugs at super high concentrations that we are probably never going to see, use, see in the clinic. But that's just our nature. 
as you can see in the Kramer et al. model, the, the amount of pharmacological activity we're exploring is actually very minimal, very little at all. And in the Mirams et al., we're exploring slightly more um, of the pharmacological space. And this might explain why a, such a simple model works so well for the Kramer et al. folks. But what does happen if we were to take the, the, the simple logistic regression model that was used by Kramer et al. and apply it to these other different data sets? So the final model, as I mentioned before, was basically a simple logistic regression model involving data from the sodium channel and the Herg channel. Notice that also that the, the model developed by um, Chantes has no way of handling agonists. Uh, that's because, like I said, the original data set that was used for looking at tosadogenic compounds basically contains an antagonists and that's it. So it's unable to apply, we're unable to apply this model or this approach uh, to the Davis et al. data because there are agonists. But we can apply it to the other uh, uh, two models that we talked about. And that's what you're seeing here at the bottom. So we tried it for the rabbit and the four category Tossad de Bois predictions and compare that to the original models, which is what you're seeing on the bottom figure here. So on the X axis, we're saying, we're asking, well, how good is the logistic regression model versus uh, using the action potential model at predicting rabbit shortening? How good is it at predicting rabbit prolongation? And how good is the logistic regression model compared to the uh, original, original model at doing the four category tosadogenic sort of predictions? Now in blue, as the, the predictivity score of the logistic regression model, and in the dark red, are the, prediction, uh, are the predictivity scores of the original model. So on the y-axis here, we're seeing a percentage scale from 0 to 80%. Now as you can see in all three uh, of these situations, the logistic regression model does not perform as well as the original model that was men mentioned in the paper. So this simple approach does not work that well for making the four category Tossade de Poix predictions, which is what was already highlighted in the Miriam Zetel paper. However, for rabbit prolongation, there is a difference, but it's, it's not huge. And the same goes for rabbit shortening. You know, so a simple logistic regression model seems to maybe perform just as well as these sort of complex models but obviously not as well. So just to summarize some of these literature models, so the large mechanistic models do appear to show a certain degree of predictivity. However, traditional statistical modeling approach also shows promise. And this is quite consistent with our modeling philosophies to a certain degree in the, in the fact that we believe that simple models are likely to, like to be more predictive over these sort of larger mechanistic models. However, that simple approach that Chan Test had developed did not work so well for dog predictions, mainly because for dog, in the dog assay data set, there were agonists. And so this model was not sort of suitable and not described a way of how you would handle agonists. Um, it did not work so well for the rabbit predictions or for the four category human Tossade de, de Poix predictions. However, it did, it did show promise. So at Physiomics, what we've done is we've tried to build a semi-mechanistic model that captures the nonlinear dynamics of the mechanistic models. And, and, and this is the key bit that, that capture the critical nonlinearities that are, are required to show that those models are predictive. And the other thing that we've decided to do is see if we could create, basically created a model that uses the same structure for all species. Now, what you saw previously is that for the dog model, there was a dog action potential model taken from literature. For the rabbit, there's a rabbit model taken from the literature. For the human, there's a human model taken from the, from the literature. And each of these models were very structurally very different to each other. Now, one of our beliefs was is that what, is it, would, it, would it be possible to have one structural model that is able to capture the dynamics that you need to be, in order to be predictive? So we can use the same structural model for all the different species, but the only thing that's different is a parameter, parameter set used for the different species. Uh, now, the advantage of this sort of simplicity, simple model that can be used for, for predictions in different animals and also in humans is that it allows you to make inferences regarding the potency of a given compound in a different species. Now, as you may well know, for some of you who have seen Physiomics webinars presentation before, we're not going to disclose the model to you. However, we will, we will show you um, how our model performs compared to literature models, and also um, the importance of measuring more than her. So we'll now basically represent the, present the results from our Physiomics model. So here we're going to compare ourselves to the model that's developed by Davis et al. So that was that large ODE dog model, a large mechanistic dog model. And what we're looking at here is basically 
the sensitivity, specificity, and predictivity scores of the dog model versus the physiomics approach, looking at prolongation or shortening. Now, what you can see is that previously, early on in the presentation, I highlighted that the model by Davis et al. wasn't actually suited to make predictions around about prolongation and shortening. And that was mainly due to the fact that it had very low sensitivity scores for both of these types of measures. However, the specificity and the predictivity were, were reasonably good. Now, as you can see from the physiomics model, that our sensitivity is remarkably improved compared to the Davis et al. model for, for testing prolongation. And our sensitivity for shortening is also improved. So this may be allow the potential to use this model, if calibrated correctly, um, to make predictions regarding prolongation and shortening, which is where the, the model developed by Davis et al. could not be used. So if we look at the rabbit data, so we only looked at one set of data from that paper, which was the data generated using Patch Express data for 77 compounds. So our model performs equally as well as, as what's seen by the rabbit, uh, by using this complex model for the rabbit. But like I said, the structure of our model that's used here is exactly the same as what's been used for the dog model. The only thing that's different is the set of parameter values that are used. Now what we can see here is that actually the sensitivity for prolongation is, 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 is improved compared to using a, a large mechanistic model. More importantly, it's the sensitivity regarding, regarding predicting shortness is improved dramatically. And, and this suggests that maybe this model could be used again to make predictions regarding shortening as well as prolongation. So we go back again to the human four category system that was developed by Miriam Zetal. So just to recap there on the left hand side describes the four category system. Again, our model performs quite well. So I'll just explain what this y-axis is here. So the y-axis is the number of compounds, and zero is basically how means we got a, a category prediction 100% correct. Um, one means we were one category away in terms of the truth prediction versus the predicted predict versus the predicted. Um, and two is basically two categories away. And as you can see from the mechanistic model that was developed that was used in the Marims et al paper they did have one compound that was predicted to be that was two categories away from the correct prediction and with our model we've been able to show that actually we have no compounds that are two mod, uh, two categories away so again this this was the same structural model that was used for using making the rabbit predictions and for the dog predictions Finally, we move on to the uh, two-category system that was used by Chan test. And this is the comparison of the physiomics model to the Chan test model. And in fact, in this situation, there is no real difference in terms of the predictivity between the logistic regression approach that Kramer et al. used and the model that we've developed ourselves in-house at physiomics. However, what is different is the, num is the compounds that have been sort of highlighted as false positives and false negatives. Now, to keep your eye on here, is that basically we have that some of the false positives that Kramer et al. have, we don't have. So, for example, disatinib and loratine, uh, false positives for the Kramer et al. approach, Chan test approach, but they're not for us. However, we have two extra false negatives that they don't, and these are paroxetine and am amoyodarone. So this highlights slightly differences in terms of sensitivities we were picking up with our model. So more back onto a bit more of the science. So what this has shown overall is that we, we then compared basically measure importing Herg versus Herg plus calcium plus sodium, and how that how measuring more how that affects your ability to make predictions um, around in the different assays. So what you're seeing on the x-axis here is using the physiomics model. Um, how does your predictivity fare when you include Herg, which is in blue, versus Herg? plus all the other channels. How does that affect dog, dog shortening, rabbit prolongation, rabbit shortening, the four category systems, uh, di system developed by Miriam et al, and the two category system that's developed by Chan Test and Kramer et al. As you can see, throughout all of these assays, measuring more than Herg is important, except it possibly in rabbit prolongation, where there isn't that much of a difference between whether you measure um, Herg or more than Herg. However, overall, it suggests that measuring more than her clearly will help you improve your, your predictive performance. 
So a summary of, 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 the, of, of the talk today and, and this section. So in-house, we have developed a single model, like a single structural model, that can be used for making uh, cardiac toxicity predictions for a number of different animal species and for humans. And like I said before, the fact that it's the same model, same structural model that's used for all the different species, this will allow you to make more inferences around about the differences between the potency of a compound in one species versus another. So the physiomics model performs better than most of these sort of large-scale mechanistic models from the analysis that we've conducted so far um, than the literature models. And the other thing to highlight here was the model developed by Kramer et al. And I think that's really important is that a simple model, such as a logistic regression model, was performing quite well to a certain degree to make certain types of predictions. Now this cardiac toxicity model is clearly in line with the principles of the three R's, which is to replace, reduce and refine. Now this model could also be used within a much larger framework to assess what additional information would be needed in addition to QT prolongation to provide a more thorough quantitative assessment of a thorough QT study. Now what I mean here is, is that predominantly what we've used in the clinic is QT prolongation and we've used that in, in some sort of clinical models to try and use that as an indication of well is that predictive of tossade de poids. Now I was wondering here is that in addition to the, what we measure in terms of QT prolongation if you were also, also to use the, the affinity that you have for each of the ion channels in addition to QT prolongation, whether or not that would be a better predictor of tosad propensity within a clinical program. Now finally, a bit of a future outlook. So we are planning to release a web-based platform which will give you access to all the literature models as well as the physiomics proprietary models. So you yourself can see how well these models are doing over time for yourselves. Now, in addition to this, we're hoping to move on from, in addition to moving on from um, making QT predictions, so also looking at contractility um, and also looking at um, using information around about sort of new stem cell based assays that are being developed. Now, like I said before, we have this linear process that exists within drug development. And, you know, when you have a linear process like this, there's always a need uh, to make a prediction about the next set of, the next stage in development based on current data have around the current stage of development. So there's all be a need to make a forecast of some type. So that's the end of today's presentation. Um, with this will has been recorded such that you can be able to listen to this again online and we'll be sending out the details um, of this presentation. If you have any questions I'll be online um, to answer any questions you have uh, for the next 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you for your time today.